Mr. Torm series that is bringing forth the Syracuse University Aging Studies Institute participation on keeping us informed, which is the halfway point in this presentation. We are pleased and complimented in waiting our speaker today, Professor Donna Corral. At first, when I saw the name Donna Corral, who is our speaker and our informer today, it wrongly occurred to me that Donna Corral was, was swinging up here from 7th Avenue. I don't think anybody in this room gets that. Donna Coran. Donna Coran. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Oh, Donna Coran. You didn't shop there very often. I get it. It's funny. Uh, however, Professor Coran Coran boogied up here from the biology department of Syracuse University, which is an easier and shorter drive than from Mid Manhattan. This morning, Professor Coran will enlighten us as to how the world and the existence of biology affects our body system which is totally, really affects the way each of us goes about our daily mission, activities, thinking, progress, and the cycle of our day. Rather than read you, Professor Carell's resume, and I'm telling you, it is long, and biography, which is impressive and extensive, please, the usual, manliest informed, warm welcome. Good, yeah. Is that okay, Mike? Yes, I appreciate it. Thank you. Get a little heat for a well, thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, and I just want to have a, not a disclaimer, but a spoiler alert, that I will be telling you a little bit about the biology, but I'm also um, about our work and how it relates to learning and memory. But I, what I'm really going to do today is I'm going to tell you, first of all, about um, aging, but also not just the, the gloom, but the glamour of aging as well. And I just want to note that that's not a typo. It's not aging and sagging. It's actually aging and saging. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm going to talk about some of the work that has led me to think that aging is not a collection of problems, actually. But instead, it's actually another point in our development. So I, I'm a lifespan developmental biologist. And I th think of aging as the late side of things and early development as the early side of things. And that just like with early development, there is growth and loss of function and so forth. So we're not going to take the aging as a deficit approach today, at least. So you can tell from the title and from what I just said that I'm actually a little bit of a Pollyanna when it comes to aging. I take the optimistic view that, um, again, that aging is not all bad, it's not all problematic, but that, again, that I'm actually going to focus on the glam, the glam and not the glue, sort of bringing in Donna Coran to the talk as well, since she's, her, her fashions are quite glamorous. So before I do, though, before I jump in, I'd like to say a few comments about myself. And that is that I've always wanted to be older, and maybe this is why I do this kind of research. As the youngest daughter of three, I thought aging would open up a, a world to me. For example, my feet would grow and I'd get to buy a new pair of shoes <laughs> to start school, instead of getting the hand-me-downs from my middle sister and my older sister. I thought that aging actually might actually let me stay up late so I could watch Mission Impossible once in a while which is what I always wanted to do when the rest of my family was watching that. Also give me the privilege to drive across the country with my high school friends and so forth. It's on and on. So I've always taken the position that I wanted to be older and thinking that age brought wisdom and age opened up opportunities. And so I think this has trickled into my approach to my research. Okay, so I really want to say at the outset also that I think there are things that actually decline, things that change. We don't run as fast as we used to. We don't jump as high as we used to. Um, we might not connect the two and two together as quickly as we used to. But with that, I believe that some things actually improve, maybe because of those losses of functions. And I'm going to talk today about why I think that's true. And because of this, I have to admit that I actually don't look for deficits. Okay, and so I'm going to tell you a little bit. We're going to go through this a little Excuse bit. Excuse me, Donna. Would it be okay if I turn off the lights? Oh, yes. You'll yeah. be in the dark a little That's bit. That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say there are different kinds of changes. So we could expect things to improve with age. What might one of those be? Wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom improves with age. That's been shown. <laughs> What's something that might decline with age? Thinking of when we... Pardon? <laughs> sex. sex. It may or may not. It depends on who you are, who your partner is, how comfortable you are with yourself, and so forth. But sex may decline. 
Sexual function may decline in women. Women go through menopause if we're lucky to live long <laughs> enough. And so our reproductive function does decline. That's a good one. And then some things stay the same, actually. Some things don't change very much, okay? And then there are other things that increase to mid-age and decline. So as you, in a sense, we're all sort of shining stars. I know it's cheesy, but again, I'm bringing this out in terms of the, the Pollyanna in me. And so when we think about lifespan development, we can actually think about every type of change that may occur, up, down, up and down, down and up, and so forth. And so I really don't want to um, approach this that it's just this collection of deficits, okay? And I think we have evidence to suggest that, okay? So it does inform the way I do my research because it allows me to look for brain and cognitive changes as opposed to brain and cognitive deficits. And if you think about, um, and the, uh, a lot of the work that's been done, at least in the biological field of aging, actually the definition of aging suggests that it's bringing us closer to death and that it's this collection of deficits. I actually take a very different perspective, even when I look at the biology of aging, that some of the changes are not deficits or de degenerative changes. They're just changes that produce an output that's different from when we were younger, okay? So that's the overall approach that I take and that wanted to set the tone for what I'm gonna tell you about. Okay, so this is a summary and not meant for you to remember anything or just for me to touch upon the kind of work that I'm involved in. We have a variety of different projects going on. Um, all of them really surround this theme of changes in function and that there are different states of our bodies, different endogenous internal states that actually uh, change the way we process information, the way we solve tasks. And, that's what, and it's actually orchestrated by different parts of our brain that at times work independently like a soloist in an orchestra or a section in an orchestra, but at other times work together like the full symphony, okay? And so we think of the brain acting that way. There are different parts that have their specialties and can show their specialties, but at oftentimes and most of the time they work together. Yeah, um, but that different um, endogenous states can actually act as the conductor and point to one brain area or point to one system and say, it's your turn now, you go. You play. And so we think that there are endogenous mechanisms such as changes in hormones. And you heard last week about changes in, your, in uh, nutrients. So that when you eat, you change the state of your brain to be better prepared to learn, better prepared to learn some things and other things. Well, we think hormones do that, reproductive hormones such as estrogens. We think changes the, our brain states. And in fact, one of my lines of work is to understand how our brains change with menopause, how women's women aging um, occurs, aging in women is what I meant, occurs in the brain and cognition. We think that your, your physical and mental fitness changes the brain areas that you use. Um, so this is our estrogen work. We think that forgetting is very important and I'll touch upon that today. And we also think of this idea that with age, there are different changes in the brain that produce improvements in some function actually and impairments in others, okay? And we look at this in the model of Parkinson's disease also, but I'm not gonna talk about that. Okay, but we can talk about it if you have questions. And of course, at any time, ask questions, and I'm comfortable um, turning the floor over to you if that's where we, we end up going. Okay, so, um, oh, so before I go on into my, um, into um, talking about this, I'd like to ask you, what is your number one fear? What are you most fearful of? Not being able to take care of ourselves. Okay, so a loss of independence. And I think memory loss. Mm -hmm. Memory loss. Driving. driving. And why is the fear of driving? What, what? Well, you're stuck. <laughs> well, you're dependent on something. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Lose, the loss of independence. Losing, losing, losing your driving, yes, yes. So that's one, one of the first um, uh, elements of our um, decrease in function that people give up driving and feel that they're losing their independence, actually. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. And the fact that our children may end up having to take care of us mm -hmm. versus, I don't think any of us really look forward to that. Right, right, absolutely. They deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> they say payback, right, for all those decades. Right. You know, Living long enough that your children get Alzheimer's and you don't. Oh, oh yeah, that would be another one. So right. almost everything I've heard is actually what, when the, the studies are done, when the research is done and collect, collect information from thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people, People of older age tend not to say that fear of dying. That doesn't even come up, actually, and it didn't in this group. But the number one fear 
that's reported the most is fear of losing one's mind and independence because of that. And so you guys hit it on the head, actually. Well, so, don't we kind of, I hate to use the word smell, don't we kind of smell it a little bit but don't want to say it? Like, just the fact that we can get easier, just that one aspect of it. Right, right. And actually, we do forget more, more easily. And that is the one common deficit that's found in the, across the animal kingdom, probably in plants, too. I don't know if old Venus flytraps forget. <laughs> um, I think they do, probably. So what happens is, you know, we all forget information more readily as we get older. I'm going to argue that this is a good thing. Okay. So we'll see if you, you agree with me by the end of the talk, or the end of the discussion. Um, so yeah, so we all for are forget get more forgetful as we get older, and but I don't think that's to say that aging equals cognitive decline, and that's one of the problems. That's one of the misconceptions is that memory we 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 collapse all of cognition, all of our problem solving into one property, and that's memory. Memory is one very small piece of cognition, and I know that the next week's speaker is going to talk a lot also about memory in. Um, applying it to everyday activities as well. And so he can hopefully follow up on some of the comments that I've made. Um, so, and we, this has infiltrated our public thinking, okay, sort of mem that aging equals cognitive decline. And we've heard the adage, the old age adage, actually that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. I mean, that's one of the most probably widely said old age um, adage about learning and memory. Well, it's not true. You can teach old dogs new tricks, and actually there are probably some tricks you can teach them better than a young puppy who can't stop to do anything, is running around, jumping. So teaching an old dog to sit is probably easier than teaching a new puppy to sit, right? Okay, so you can teach an old dog new tricks, maybe not the same tricks that they learned as a younger dog, okay? Okay, so there's this perception that aging, I mean that cognition declines with age, and all of cognition, and we become essentially demented with age, and that's just not true, and what, you guys are living examples of that, actually. Okay, so one of the reasons, I think, and again, um, this, these are just my points of view, that um, laboratory experiments tend to favor young adults. So a lot of our research that we know about young, differences between young and older adults are done in a way that we take young adults and evaluate them and compare them to older adults. There are some very large scale studies that look at longitudinal changes, changes with age within individuals as they age, but those take decades to do in humans, right? So those are not done that often in laboratory settings, in individuals' labs, because it takes too long to, to watch an individual age and study them over the course of decades. Certainly graduate students can't do that work well easily because they want to get out in five to seven years, and so you don't see much aging going on then. So most of the time we're taking young adults and most of those young adults are college students, okay? So I don't know the statistic, but it's probably 90 to 95% or more of um, information we know about young adults' cognition is from college students, okay? Um, and we know that young adults are test able, okay? Even if they're not familiar with the tests that they're given, they're really com good at taking tests because that's what we do in college, right? Or in school, in grade school and in high school. And mo many older adults have not been in school for a long time, okay? And so even if you've taken classes or come to um, lifelong learning events, you're not necessarily taking tests, okay? So you're not as test able as young adults. And especially when those tests are timed, we see even bigger differences than when we leave the timing off, when the, the tests are open-ended. Okay, so young adults tend to be test able and are good at very timed, fast processing. But when given the opportunity and given the open uh, and uh, non-timed tests, older adults often do quite well, sometimes just as well as younger adults, okay? <clears throat> and then there's this idea that we've developed the tests with the idea that young is the normal, that the young adults are the controls, and we're looking for, for changes or deficits with age. <clears throat> Excuse me when instead we could take the perspective, let's see what older adults do well and see how well, you know, how well a young adult could do. And that would be a very different way to approach it. That is, we would then see maybe deficits in young adults because they can't problem solve the way an older adult might. Okay? But most of the time we don't develop those kinds of tests, that we being them, because I don't do much work with humans. But most of the tests haven't been developed to evaluate uh, deficits in young adults in, in problem solving, or cognition actually. 
So I like to sometimes dream, I, you know, I'm a dreamer. What would we think? What would we know? What would our research findings say if we actually used old adults as the control? And we say that as old as normative. Okay, what is the norm for an older adult and see how they're different from young adults? How are you defining old? What age group? So that's a really good question. And actually, I pose this when I teach my biology of aging class. What do we mean by old? So we can mean functionally old. So someone, in fact, we just saw the um, Summer Olympics. There are lots of gymnasts who are 25 that are considered old, right? Old yeah. for their career, old for their work. Um, and there are judges that are 80, and they're not old for their work. So what do we mean? Generally, we've gone back and forth in the field to use chronology as opposed to function, and it's, it's um, been exchanged many times. But generally, we mean individuals that are 65 and older. And then there's now the young old, which is 65 to about 80, the, the mid old. It used to be young old and old old. Now there's young old, mid old, and old old. So now as we get, we're living longer and longer, we're going to keep inserting little sections in there. And I have a really funny, I wish I had brought this picture. My son, when he was about, he was a you know, child of two nerds, um, and he, he handed me the sheet. He said, this is what aging is. And it was, he had, he had provided his own chronology, his chronological breakdown of aging, and it went zero to half, and then baby, 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 or something, half to one, infant, one to three, toddler, and he was seven at the time or something, goes, and then it was like seven, big boy, <laughs> and then it went like eight to ten, I mean, it, it, and young age was broken up into like 15 segments, and then it was like, there was a big chunk for middle age, a big chunk for old, and then it had 100 to infinity, and then he had scratched out infinity because he realized that no one lives forever. And it made him very sad, actually. We talked about it, and then he's like, 100 and over ancient. <laughs> um, anyway, it just, so it just it depends on perspective is the point that I was trying to make, but that we actually tend to say 65 and older are considered mature or older adults. Um, okay, so again, most a lot of the tests are done. Middle age is a lost um, group because a lot of individuals who are middle age tend to be either working in the home or working out of the home. So it's harder to bring them into lab, the laboratory for testing. So a lot of what we know is about young adult college students and older adults who are not working in the, anymore, or at least retired, consider themselves retired. Okay, so, oops, okay, so, what we have gleaned from this work is that, um, again, that younger and older adults might process information in very different ways, and it's most likely a, a consequence of underlying brain changes, okay? And that we take the approach that, and there's some evidence to suggest this, and I'll describe one piece of evidence, um, that loss of one function may lead to a gain in another. So for example, if you're, um, walking down the street and you're running, you're less likely to see a dropped bracelet on the side of the street. And if you're taking a leisurely stroll, you might see that someone lost a bracelet. So again, just the fact that you're going more slowly opens your eyes up to other things that if you had gone more quickly, you wouldn't have seen. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of approach that I'm taking. And this is actually um, uh, really inspired um, me from the work of Oliver Sacks. I don't know if you knew, know who he was or who yeah. he is, but he passed away last year. He's been one of my academic in inspirations, actually. I read him when I was a young student, and I fell in love with this book. In fact, I brought my new copy because the old one has fall fallen apart. But it's um, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And he was a uh, neurologist that actually studied many, many individuals. And he really approached the problems of neurology, neural disorders, individuals with um, severe schizophrenia, individuals with severe brain damage, that actually, when you study those, yes, they have a large loss of function in the area of their brain damage. But what he found and wrote about was that you actually see improvements, gains in other functions. And he has a very funny piece about um, on the neural ward, and he was watching people watch TV, and they were cracking up, and it was actually a speech by, it's called Ronald Reagan's speech, and why some people were cracking up and some people were crying, actually. And it turned out that different types of brain damage meant that the individuals could either hear, like, the honesty or dishonesty in his words and his to intonations, or it could, they thought that they could watch his facial movements, or they really noticed his facial movements, and it was disconnected to some of the words he was saying. 
And so um, he, he writes and really describes this idea that there are gains in functions because of the loss of function, perhaps. Yes? I don't know if you know that one of the reasons that title is the way it is, who mistook his wife, he had that disease, whatever it's called, that he didn't recognize faces at all. Right, prosopagnosia. It's wife. called prosopagnosia. Including his own wife. Right, right. Yeah, so there are disorders where all of us have better or worse face recognition. But there are individuals that can't recognize faces at all. And it's a special kind of disorder with an inability to configure the parts into a whole. And faces are very special kinds of, oops, excuse me, configurations. They're very special. And that it really is the relationship between the, the units that makes a face. And people can, who can't recognize faces at all, you're right, they can't recognize um, their themselves, their children, their, children, their loved ones. Um, without having any real memory problems. Their memory is intact and fine. They just cannot put those pieces together to recognize faces. Um, so anyway, so Oliver Sacks really inspired me to start thinking about this. And he really focused on individuals with brain damage and disorders. And I started thinking about this in terms of aging and cognition. And that maybe what we've done is we've taken kind of this field of aging and cognition and um, Take, taken shifts in strategies, shifts in ability to process information in certain ways, and turned it into deficits. So I started to apply that to my own work. Um, okay, so this I think highlights what I'm, um, what I've been thinking. Okay, so this is a comic. You see the the gentleman is from For Better or For Worse, one of my favorites, and you see it says that's strange. I know I. Um, I poured myself a cup of coffee, and we've all had this experience before. Oh yes, I left it in the rec room while I was watching the news. Goes down to the rec room, comes down, gets distracted a little bit, looks at something, and then thinks, huh, okay, what did I just come here for? And so, it, so he had some memory lapse, a little bit of forgetfulness, probably because he was distracting himself. And then, he, and that wasn't working. His memory, he's thinking, he's thinking, what am I here, that's not working. So he tries a new strategy, ask the family. Ask someone else, does anyone know why I'm down here? And it's likely that someone might have um, suggested, yes, I know why you're down here, you're looking for your cup of coffee, because they heard perhaps if he muttered it out loud. So what we do is we tend to learn to, we learn to engage strategies that are useful, that help us um, get around the world in a useful way, and to solve our problems. And he, this is a perfect example where he actually engaged in a new strategy. And in fact, if this happens a lot, he may find himself telling someone, I'm going to go down to look for my cup of coffee. So he has that, read, that strategy ready when he forgets, and he can just ask, and still make his way around the world. Okay? So we, then, we tend to use strategies that are useful. And so this, to me, suggests that a younger adult may have never even had the psychological maturity or the wisdom to yell to ask someone where they were. They would continue to look, and maybe they would never have forgotten, because they use a different strategy to find their cup of coffee. Okay. So what we do is we take these ideas, and we bring them into a laboratory where we study rodents, and we study rodents that age. First of all, they age more quickly than um, than humans because they don't live as long. So we can actually study young and old rats fairly easily. We can actually look at changes across age or changes between different ages. And we've developed tests um, in our other work and in this work with aging that allow us to actually interrogate, to actually ask in a very um, subversive way the animals what strategies they're using to solve a task. Okay, So we've actually developed tasks that tell us the strategy, the cognitive strategy a rat may use. Okay. So just like each of you got here in different ways. So if I were to ask you, how did, how did you get from your home or where you were before here to here? You might tell me what? I drove. You drove, but the, did you follow <coughs> you Google or did you know? Did you, did you I know the route. You know the route, and so you followed certain routes, okay? Anyone else use their phone? Well, the first time you came here, you might use a map or ask for directions, right? And so we use different strategies to, to navigate our worlds, okay? Well, what we do is we've taken the, nat the rat's natural tendency to also like to navigate its world, especially if you make them a little hungry and there's food um, in their world. They'll actually learn to solve mazes very quickly. And so what we've done, and this was developed in 1950 by um, Edward Tolman, who is, um, was um, an expert in cognition in, um, in, um, in rodents and in humans. Um, and what this... This, what this maze does is it allows you to train the rat. It's a very simple maze. You can see it's plus shaped. 
and it, um, we make, turn it just into a simple tea. And there, we asked the rat to find food, the, excuse me, the maze is placed in a room with lots of visual cues so that, that, that are very salient to the rat. So they can use the cues in their environment like we do when we drive here. If someone took away all the road signs and all the trees and all the buildings, it would be a little harder to navigate our environment. So we use the cues in our environment too. And rats do that very well to find food. So the, the maze is put into a room with cues. And we, all we do is we take a slightly hungry rat and we ask them to find food in the maze. And all they have to do is go to this choice point and turn right or go to this part of the room. So every training trial, they're started here and the food is over here. So the animal has to learn to go over here for food or to turn right. And so there are probably more, but we were not clever enough to figure out how the rat actually thinks. But for us, we think there are two strategies the rat can use to solve this task. So we call it the dual solution test. There are two correct strategies. One is the rat can ignore its body turn and it can just learn to go to that set of cues. I'm gonna go over there where that camera is and that's, I know the food is always there. So they can learn that strategy or they can ignore the cues in the room and say, when I get to the choice point, when I have to make a choice, I just turn right. And so that's all they have to learn, right? So there are two ways to solve this that are both correct. <clears throat> So during training, the rat um, tell, tells us that it shows that it's learning. It gets, it gets up to 100% correct, actually. And though when we, it gets to 90% correct, which is our form of an A, when it gets an A, we actually probe it or we ask it, we interrogate the rat for which strategy it's using. Now remember, both are correct. So what we do is we then take the rat and put them, we start them from the opposite side. Now, if the rat actually turns right, going to the opposite side of the room, it's essentially telling us that it was using a turning strategy while it learned, okay? So that's what, it was using a turning strategy to solve the task. If the rat turns left and goes to this side of the room, it's essentially telling us it's using a place strategy. It's going to that place in the room. It's not using a body response, an R. So then we have two different kinds of tasks. One that is go over there, and it tells us it's going over there, the place strategy, and one is to turn that way or make a right turn. So what's really fascinating, and I'm not gonna talk about this, but if we take female young rats and give them hormones, the kind of estrogens that we know fluctuate across the reproductive cycle, we know we lose estrogens as we get older, estrogens actually promote this place learning strategy, but actually impair this response learning strategy. So it actually shifts rats to solve the task in a certain way. Now, if we take old rats and we put in, we take old rats and compare them to young rats, we find something very fascinating. And that is that with age, we see shifts in the learning strategy that the old animals use compared to the youngs. But we actually don't see any differences in their learning ability. They can learn this task just as quickly and just as well as the young animals. Or I could say it the other way. The young animals learn this just as well as the old animals. They just use different strategies. And the results are shown here. So let me orient, orient you to the graph a little bit. So in the blue, you'll see the young, the, the data for the young animals, and then old, you'll see the data for the old animals. And on the y-axis, you'll see percent of rats showing one <coughs> strategy versus another. And the young animals, it's not 100%, but what we see is a shift towards them using place strategies. And these are young males and old males. We didn't use females for this experiment, <coughs> but we have other work that shows similar kinds of trends, excuse me. So the young animals, there's a bit larger proportion of them that use play strategy over response strategies, but in the old animals, we see that the bigger proportion of them actually use response strategies, the turning strategies over the place strategies. Now again, remember, each strategy was equally effective. They were equally effective strategies. They learned that the animals learned the problem. They solved the problem. And when we actually look at the number of trials it takes the, the animals to learn, they're exactly the same. If anything, the old animals learn a little faster, actually. What there does no the sense of smell have to do with this? Oh, that's a really good point. Because actually, what we do, I didn't mention this, but we put smell cues in all the arms. So oh. that, uh, that they can't get to the smell, but they um, smell, so the whole maze smells like the food. Okay. That's a really good point. Because otherwise, you could argue yeah. that <laughs> the old animals can't smell it very well, and that's why the young animals are doing better. And so we have to control for that for everything we do. It's a very good point. 
You could also, so, so we see that the old animals actually choose this response strategy and the young animals tend to choose this play strategy. Again, no difference in the, how fast they learn, but actually a difference in the cognitive approach. So we feel like there's a difference in how, not how much they learn. And that's a really important point to take home. Now it's interesting though, because, um, what's, what's your name? Gail. Gail. Gail mentioned a really important point, And that is, we think there might be a biological underpinning to this. Okay, it's not just that it's just based on psychological, you know, some other non-biological phenomenon. So we think something about the nervous system or the body is actually creating this shift. And it could be that the old animals don't see the cues in the room that well, right? So it could be that the, they, so they rely on this other strategy. It could be that they see the cues, but the brain areas regulating those strategies aren't working as well. And that's the kind of research that we're doing is to try to figure out what is different about the old and young animals that make them use these different strategies. And tying back to some of the work that Paul um, Gold spoke about last week, um, we think that the bioenergetic um, provisions to the brain is really essential to how well these different brain areas or cognitive strategies work. So that if the brain areas that are involved in this strategy are function getting the fuel they need, they're gonna work well. And if they're not getting the fuel they need, they might not work well, producing this kind of shift, okay? So there is a biology to this. Um, we're just literally now trying to figure that out, so I don't have a lot of results for you about what that might be. But you have to always be careful to make sure, if you're, if you're interested in cognition, you have to make sure that the sensory and motor functions are matched. And so that's why Gail brings up a really important point, because if they can't see the cues, then you're not really studying memory or cognition, you're studying sensory function or visual function, okay? So we always match that carefully. <clears throat> okay, so again, I keep talking about this, loss in one context may be balanced by a gain in another, but I think it's a really key point because actually, now you can imagine a situation where an older rat, if they're forced to use that place strategy, they might not do so well. And a younger rat, if it's forced to use that response strategy, they might not do that well because those are the those are go against their preferred strategies. And so we've actually done that, where we take mazes similar to this, and we can, the solution is only by using the place, that you, can, you force them so they you devise the task so they cannot use a turning strategy to solve the task. And in those cases, we see older animals do poorly on the place learning, and younger animals do poorly on the response learning. So again, we now, and then the, the, the benefits are seen in the reverse. The old animals do well, better than young animals on response learning, and the young animals do better than the old animals on place learning. So it's not really the details about the specific kinds of cognition that I'm um, trying to get across. It's that the, there are different strategies that are preferred and that actually are um, optimal for both young and old animals. And again, we're trying to figure out why. Is it some kind of true cognitive change or is it some underlying biology? And we think that it has to do with the, the, the changes in the brain um, areas that um, participate in these two different cognitive tasks. <clears throat> okay, so we still, what's still interesting though is that even if we test these animals and then wait a couple weeks, it seems like the young animals, so if they all learn, the young animals are more likely to hold on to the information, okay? And that's something that I, we talked about before. And in the comic strip, the older man, gen, um, the grandfather looking for his cup of coffee, we're more forgetful as we get older. Now, one of my students captured this perfectly, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this. So they, this is, I love this. I mean, this student got an A on this essay because he started out with this, and he didn't know that he was pandering to his teacher. Older adults aren't bad at remembering, they are just good at forgetting. And this captures some of the work we do, and it captures everything I talked about in that unit, and so that's why he got such a good grade on this. And I just saw that, I thought, I have to write that down, that's, that's, that's wonderful. And that's true, and I'm gonna tell you why forgetting is really important, okay. So I want you to look at the screen. Oh, sorry, before I do that. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why forgetting is so important. There is this, do you know about Mr. S? This, oh, okay. No. And other people also have that, where they can't forget anything. Yeah, the so. perfect autobiographical memory. That's been in the news over the last five years. Yeah. And actually, um, there's some really great, there's a 60 Minutes pieces, and one of, um, yeah. Dr. Gold might have talked about this last week, but there, his postdoc mentor, 
who was my graduate school mentor, was is the uh, Jim McGaw, who's one of the researchers who's actually done this, is doing this work with these people with perfect autobiographical memory. Um, now their memory is pretty good, perfect, autobiographically, but they tend to forget some things that don't have direct consequence on their lives. So they're not as perfect as Mr. S, but they're very close. And most of those, if you actually watch those shows, they tend to be not odd in a bad way, but kind of unusual, maybe a little obsessive compulsive. You know, they have these little idiosyncrasies that I think encourage their ability to chronicle their life like, like they have a flip calendar in their head where they can just flip through the dates and see and so I think if you look in their daily lives, they tend to be hyper-organized. In fact, um, one um, you know, organized their 80 pairs of shoes into like rainbow colors. I mean, in terms of like start with brown, yellow, red, blue, you know, all in the closet. And so very different kinds of ways of, um, or extreme ways of kept organizing their world. Mr. S was a really interesting um, individual. And actually I have this book here. Um, so, and I really encourage you to, to read this too if, this, if you find this interesting. He was um, a, a Russian, a young man who was a, started out as a journalist, and he got he was um, found by this famous psychologist um, Alexander Luria, um, who ended up writing a book about him, *The Mind of a um, and they, He started um, observing or uh, working with Mr. S, and they became lifelong friends. But what happened was Mr. S was a journalist, and he would go into his um, editor meeting at the beginning of the workday, and the editor would give, um, give all the assignments out, and Mr. S would just sit there, and everyone's writing feverishly with their pen, paper, pad of, pen, pad of paper, and um, he just sat there, and then went off and did his work and came back, and the, the editor started getting very frustrated, thinking, first of all, who's doing the work for him? He's not taking any notes. That's not the way a journalist works, and he'd write these beautiful stories, and so he finally said, you're, you're not even paying attention. And he said, what do you mean? Of course I'm paying attention. This was after months of working there. And he said, well, okay, you know, he's like, oh, what do you mean? He's like, well, you're not writing anything down. He's like, I never write anything down. So this person didn't really know that they even had perfect memory. They didn't even know it. And he said, well, okay, tell me, what did I say to him today? You know, what was his Joe's assignment? He said, oh, well, he was supposed to go cover the, the river flooding. And he said, well, what was so-and-so's? And he went through the room and he knew everyone's assignment, including his own. And that's when the editor thought, okay, this person's different. You know, he wasn't writing down a thing, he had perfect memories. And so, um, so Luria started studying him. And it's true, he had perfect memory. It was unbelievable. Well, this poor gentleman ended up becoming a, worked at a carnival. He was, um, he became a nemanist. Um, he had a series of jobs. He could never function very well because first of all, his memory started interfering with his, his previous memory started interfering with his ability to just think um, so that he'd have a lot of infiltration of thoughts. But also, he also had a lot of problems where he had, um, um, I'm blanking on the word, I have yes. um, uh, synesthesias where like different um, sensory modalities would start to overlap. So he would see things in sound and smell things in color and so he had a lot of difficulty with processing information. One of the most compelling parts though, and this is from this book um, that, that, that struck me, was that when, Miss, when um, Luria was taking a walk, they used to walk through the woods and talk all the time. Um, and he asked Mr. S, after one very long hike one day, he asked Mr. S, he said, oh, you made just a lovely fall day. He said, how did you like the trees? And Mr. S says back to him, which ones? Okay, and they had a longer conversation, and it turned out that Mr. S couldn't form a concept of trees because he was so struck by the memories of each one. So, was his memory um, consistent across uh, the board? So, his interpersonal memory. So, if we had a conversation um, and shared personal information about our families, for example, would he remember that too? He would remember that. Now, he did have struggles sometimes with faces. If, if I re read, if I remember correctly, because he was so fixated on the individual parts of the face that he would actually sometimes have trouble, um, like a smiling, you with a smiling face is different than you with a non-smiling face. So he could actually remember each part and then he'd get distracted by the way your eyebrow was. So he had a little bit of trouble with configurations also. But with information, he could remember it. And visual memory was really good. I think so, I believe so. Um, 
Yeah, so, so, you know, I highlight this that we think, like, if you ask any of us, if you could have perfect memory, would you? And, I mean, hands no. go up. Absolutely. I know. I'm so glad I'm not special in that way. <laughs> yeah. And why do you say? I'd like to hear. Well, because I wouldn't want my head, my head is full enough without <laughs> having perfect memory, and there are some things I'd rather forget. Yes, it's just As like. all of this food, I'm sure. Yes. Well, I'm just like, yes. Actually, absolutely. I'd like to forget that I had a cookie this morning. <laughs> Well, I've already forgotten. <laughs> Piece of cake. So, Albert Hubbard, who was, just, he was a, a Americana writer, said, it, you know, a retentive memory may be a good thing, but the ability to forget is the true token of greatness. And so I like that, because I think it's true. And Mr. S is a perfect example. So, Mr. S, I just have a nice picture of the forest and the trees, and we tend to be able to look at and think about both, and we would probably forget some of the information. Um, but Mr. S couldn't conceptualize, so that was one of his big problems, okay? He really couldn't, literally could not see the forest through the trees. And that is something, and that is one bit of thinking that actually improves greatly with age. We are able to start making the helicopter out and back, back and forth, close and far, to come up with conceptualizations to problem solve without getting caught in the petty details, actually. Okay? And so I have this question, does age-related forgetting help us to see the forest? Again, I told you I was a Pollyanna, it was a spoiler <laughs> alert. So I would argue, yes, that the forgetting actually allows us to form frameworks. If we were to f remember everything, we wouldn't be able to function, actually, just like Mr. S. And so, so I- We wouldn't need pencils and paper. We wouldn't, who needs them anyway anymore, right? <laughs> no, we wouldn't need pencils and paper, you're right. But I would, argue, I would rather write something down and be able to forget about it and refer to it than to be able to think freely about other things personally. But again, there's strengths to each, right? But I think that what happens is we have this age-related forgetting that maybe helps us to see the forest. There's some evolutionary biology that would support that. We've gotten to, we passed our reproductive age, we've survived this long, the details don't matter actually. We know what foods to eat and not to eat as long as we can recognize them. So again, in some ways, um, we don't need to be building those frameworks with the details. We need to be uh, uh, using those strategies um, effectively. Okay. So I just want you to look at this. And if you, if some of you know art at all, Giuseppe um, Archimboldo is a famous artist who used to use um, various objects to create other objects. So, okay. So I'm going to just have you look at this. And then if I asked you what you saw, what did you see? Carrots. You saw carrots. Yeah. Onions. Onions. A fun looking man. A funny looking man. <laughs> <laughs> that was the answer I was looking for. But, so you guys are doing well, you're remembering all the details. Okay, anything else? Did, did, did all of you see a face? Yes. yes. Okay, was that the first thing you saw, perhaps? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so I would argue that there are people, maybe even young people, that wouldn't even see this as a face, maybe very young. They would actually see the parts. So if we were focused on the details, we would see the onion very good and the carrots and whatever tubers and all different kinds of vegetables um, that actually create this. And so if we focused on the details, in a month I might say, what was in that picture that I showed you? You might remember a face or the face, but you might not. And, but if you remembered all the details, it may cloud your ability to see the face and vice versa. Okay. So this gets us to this idea of the detail versus the gist, that older adults tend to remember the gist and actually um, can, and are less good at remembering the detail as younger adults. And younger adults, while they can learn the gist, they're often less able or less likely to use the gist in their problem solving. Okay. So now we have an age-related difference. Um, so older adults remember the gist well, and I say embrace your gist if you can. Um, and that if you remember back to Mr. S or think about Mr. S, the gist may actually be important for our, our ability to form concepts and to engage in problem solving, okay, that are as healthy for an older um, individual. And we know that concept formation is, of course, important for problem solving. Okay, so there's this um, famous gerontologist, um, Jean Cohen, who developed this idea of that first of all, there is developmental intelligence, that as we get older, we get wiser, and that he's, he formalized it into a few different kinds of thinking. Um, but that really sets it in a real world setting that often, again, it's harder to do experiments um, to tap into real, real world abilities. And we often try to break our cognitive abilities down into the basic elements of cognition, and that's, that's very um, 
fruitful endeavor as well, but it might not tell us the full picture of how an older adult may function in the real world or in everyday settings. So Gene Cohen tried to do this in his work and I believe was um, well respected in some camps. Um, and that this idea that problem solving actually does improve with age, even if we see in the laboratory sometimes that time, the time to problem solve goes down. Okay? And he tells this funny story about his in-laws that they were um, coming to dinner and they arrived into Washington, D.C. by the metro, the subway. And they emerged from the, the subway into a horrible snowstorm, just driving snow, a horrible snowstorm. And it was too far for them to walk to the house, and it was horrible weather. Anyway, they didn't want to, to uh, injure themselves. They were in the, their mid to late 70s. And so they hailed a cab. Well, it was rush hour. No cab stopped. They were getting cold. They were worried about falling. And so what did he see? Howard, his um, father-in-law, saw a pizza joint across the street. Maybe they walked a block or two to try to find a cab. So he, they marched into the pizza joint, and they said, we'd like to order a an extra large pizza for delivery. And the guy said, okay, great, what's the address? <laughs> and he said, the address is, and he gave um, Gene and his wife's um, address. And he said, but there is one more thing. And so the cashier was like, oh yeah, what's that? He's like, we would like to be delivered with it. <laughs> <laughs> and they showed up at dinner with their pizza and themselves happy and warm and safe. And again, this, this is a perfect example of um, the ability to problem solve. Um, he might not have. He might have had to look up the address in his in his cell phone. That's not the point. The point is that he actually could tap into a strategy that he had used in the past that had worked, and also feel comfort. This idea of psychological maturity to feel comfort to go outside the box to use a different strategy, just like the grandfather in the comic to yell mm -hmm. up to ask for help, essentially. And so this was a clever, um, I thought, a clever example to show that, that we gain developmental, that there is developmental intelligence. And this idea that it's the maturation of synergy between cognition, again, not just memory, because that does decline um, in some areas, in some types of, for some types of information, emotional intelligence, judgment, social skills, and life experience. Donna, yes. how do you factor in cultural and class differences? Now, when you test college students, you're, you're picking the cream of the crop, mm -hmm. uh, mostly, right. right? And so when you pick adults, those who, who would uh, go for testing would also be of a certain level of, in, of uh, educational background mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you factor that in? That's a real problem, actually. So, yeah. with, and I don't know if, um, if Bill is going to speak about that um, next week. But there's something called what's called a cohort effect, so that different individuals um, born at different times have different generational influences over, over how they perform. Um, and so there's that issue that you're actually looking intergenerationally as well as um, inter-age chronology. We can never take that out. That's the problem with aging. It's, you can never do a perfect experiment where you just randomly assign, okay, you're the old group, you're the young group. You, know, you can't really do a study the way we do with other kinds of experiments. So we have this problem. There are ways, there are experimental designs that allow you to do that, but when you do that, you have to repeatedly test individuals so that you actually do those longitudinal studies where you're watching them age. And so you can then factor out the, the year that they were born into and how that has affected their aging and compare that to um, the, um, the, the age differences that you see. So, we're, so that in that case, you would be looking at age changes within a group of individuals. And then you can factor out culture, um, generation, and so forth. But you bring up another really important point that has always bothered me, and it's whether you work with uh, humans or worms or flies or rats, and that is that when you're looking at older adults, you're looking at the survivors, right? And so we have a health, it's called the healthy aging bias. So every older adult that comes into testing has survived to old age, yeah. or older age. The younger adults, a proportion of those, a large proportion of those are not gonna make it to those old age. So you're looking at a very heterogeneous, in some ways, young adult population and a homogeneous, more homogeneous older population in some ways, when you think about that. So maybe that balances it out a little bit. Um, again, there are statistical and experimental design ways to address those. Problem. But it's a really important problem. And I think when we do our rodent studies, the same thing, that the rat, a 24-month-old, a two-year-old rat is an old rat. But when we compare them to the three-month-olds, 
some of those three-month-olds, if we were to watch them, they wouldn't survive past 12 months, perhaps, because they would have a disease and they would die from other things, not necessarily old age. So we have this healthy aging bias that I think we always have to be sensitive to when we make our interpretations. Have any studies like this ever been done with a prison population, like with people that have been put in prison and they're there for like 25, 30, 40 years? Yes, actually, and not very many, surprisingly, but there are studies, and actually people in confinement um, don't age as well as you could imagine, both on all, pretty much any measure that's been taken. And you bring this up, it's very timely. I'm just finishing a grant proposal to NIH that looks at solitary, like soli the neurobiology of solitude, and we actually, there's been a lot of uh, commentary about solitary confinement in the last, just, few months and that in our own locally as well that there are some juveniles that have been put into solitary confinement it's horrible and that's a whole other conversation we can have after um, but we're trying to look at the actual neural and cognitive effects of and even one day of confinement actually that way um, but that with older adults we become a little bit more solitary changes in we were talking about changes in sensory function once your hearing starts to decline a little bit you're less likely to engage in conversation and interactions with you know, friends and and family um, so you become more and more there's more and more solitude as we get older too so we're looking at this idea of solitude um, but prisons I think there are it's an interesting um, demographic because they share similar food and so forth. And there was a classic study done called the Nun Study. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, where um, David Snowden actually um, took um, nuns, not took, but asked nuns to participate. He didn't just grab them. Um, <laughs> nuns to um, participate because they had such a um, consistent homogeneous environment uh, growing up. Most of them entered the convent at around 20 to 25. Similar food, water, everything, and has found some really, really fascinating um, findings that, um, and his was mainly a focus on Alzheimer's, but he looked at healthy aging as well, that um, your uh, sort of linguistic ability in youth actually predicts, um, has predictive value over whether you uh, age healthily in terms of cognitive aging. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's also, uh, it's called Aging with Grace, and that's the name of his book if you're interested. It's a really, it's wonderfully written and fascinating. I mean, yeah. What I have you, the Women's Health Initiative, mm -hmm. which is a longitudinal study. I thought there was an aging component that was going along with it. I don't know. There is. And um, so, what, um, what? What's your name? Pardon me? What's your name? Eleanor. Eleanor is referring to is this um, longitudinal study that was started in the 90s um, to look at um, the effects of aging in women and especially with hormone replacement therapy and the health benefits of, of hormones on whole body health, heart health, cancers, but brain health it and Alzheimer's. breast cancer and Alzheimer's. Yeah, yeah, it started with that. And some, some of the, the, the studies had to be halted early on because um, the hormones were increasing risk for some of the diseases. They were protective over other diseases. There are some issues with how the study's designed as well um, in terms of the, taking it, uh, women who were 15 to 30 years post-menopause and giving hormones too, too long after the, the hormones. But that is a longitudinal study now that they're actually still continuing to collect um, information on. And there was just a recent finding that women who have diabetes in uh, middle age, who have type 2 diabetes, um, so who get metabolic disorder in middle age, actually are more likely to have um, deficits or um, risks, increased risk if they take hormone replacement therapy than women who don't have diabetes or metabolic disorders. So there's some interesting findings coming out of that and it's, it's longitudinal f following women before and after they have the hormones and with and without the hormones. So in that sense, it's a good clinical um, trial study where they're actually ex um, randomizing the exposure. Um, Okay, so back to saging um, with aging. And so Cohen suggests that there are, the age-related improvements in thinking that we see really go across three different kinds of thinking um, types. The systematic thinking, which is the ability to see the big picture. Uh, again, as I mentioned, helicopter in and out. Like you see the details, use the details to problem solve, but you don't necessarily have to remember all the details to problem solve it. But then to be able to then not get caught up, caught up in the petty details. He says um, relativistic thinking improves 
That is that most um, information, most positions are not black and white, that there's a gray zone to most things and that, that, that that's okay and used to use in problem solving. And then that dualistic thinking also improves. This idea that you can actually accept opposing views. Things are not, um, that you, and that goes into this idea of not black and white. Does that mean agreeing? It doesn't necessarily agreeing, it's just saying that they can both exist at the same time. So usually younger adults actually have a harder time accepting the fact that a different point of view that may be the opposite can also hold weight or hold water, okay? But older adults tend to say that you can accept those opposing views that they can exist <clears throat> at the same time. Um, and again, suggest, he suggests that this helps with our problem solving. And so again, I would argue that these are different kinds of strategies for thinking. In some contexts, one way might be better than in other contexts. It's just where we find them most effective. I think Cohen would say that these are always more effective in an older person's life, but um, I'm not sure we see that necessarily in our research. So just to start to encapsulate this, we see, um, again, to kind of bring us into reality, there are increases in world knowledge. You know more, you can access your strategies you've used better. Um, we might call it wisdom, others call it um, developmental intelligence. There are decreases in function. Again, I'm not gonna be unrealistic. The speed of processing is certainly flaw, um, goes declined. It's very slow and it starts well before you might think of yourself as older. That starts in middle age, essentially. Um, fluid intelligence is again another term that's used a lot. It's this idea of your ability to um, work with memory, to uh, manipulate it. Um, the idea that you can, this is what I find interesting, that problem solving skills tend to decline. Um, I would argue that a lot of those problem solving skills may be timed when they're done in the laboratory and so older adults don't do as well. They don't problem solve as quickly, but they can still problem solve well. And then again, memory. So forgetfulness increases but memory, memory declines. Again, remember, I think that I should have put forgetfulness here, that the increase in forgetfulness may be how we can problem solve. And then there's this idea that expertise can trump youth, um, that you may have slower processing speed, but that you have, you're an expert. You can actually overcome some of your little memory, um, your forgetfulness. So how many of you play bridge or, would, or have played bridge? And I noticed, I think there's some bridge games going on um, around, yeah. Um, when you play bridge, do you feel like you're, you still play as well as you did 20 years ago? That's my wife better. <laughs> probably, maybe better, yeah, better. Well, you probably gained a lot of strategies for playing bridge and you've tapped into those strategies when you play. You may have a little, your forgetfulness probably doesn't show up when you're playing bridge. You have strategies to remember. You probably have strategies, I, can, I never learn bridge. In fact, I have tear, tearful incidents with my family trying to teach me bridge. <laughs> Always felt like I was the dummy, literally. Um, and I still can't learn it. I still can't play, I play many other card games. But, but anyway, your expertise may trump the, the functions that you've um, lost, essentially. And the classic example of this is the um, secretary study where um, young and old <coughs> individuals were asked to, to type. And um, older adults type more slowly than younger adults, so they produce fewer um, words per minute. When you take, you take out who were secretaries or not, um, the older secretaries actually typed the, the fastest. And the idea is that they had strategies for typing quickly. They had been secretaries for 30 to 50 years and could type faster than the young secretaries and faster than the other individuals. So their expertise actually allowed them to, to chunk words and do sorts of um, typing strategies that, that allowed them to do better. Okay, so even on a sensory motor task that involves cognition, cognitive processing, expertise can trump. Okay, so I'm just gonna end with one note, and that is, if this is all true, then why do we see older adults that might be aging without aging? So why are there all, you know, we have friends, colleagues, loved ones, ourselves, we feel like, you know, maybe we're not really staging. And I would argue that um, a lot of what we see is that so if we keep fit, both mentally and physically, we actually keep our cognition fit. And that actually, even if we haven't been mentally or physically fit throughout all of our lives, that it's never too late to start to help brain function um, and cognition improve into old age or protect its health into old age. And so I do go by the idea, use it or lose it, and I actually like to say use it and boost it, because I think that you're not just gonna stop the decline, you're actually gonna boost your abilities and boost your function, both physically and cognitively. And this is just to remind me that 
we are kind of a um, sedentary culture. So even when someone says, I'm going to go take the dog for a walk, <laughs> you can't necessarily trust that they're going to get a lot of aerobic fitness from walking that dog, right? That's crazy person. Okay. So it's never too late to be active, and some of you may have seen this book. It's, I love this one as well. Growing Old is Not for Sissies, number two. There are, there's probably a third version of it out now, but it really chronicles and has beautiful pictures of aging athletes or senior athletes. Um, this is one of my favorite, Ernestine Shepard. This is a picture of her when she, she's 80. And she is the oldest women's weightlifter that um, is around. And I just think this is something to strive for, however, old, you know, however young you are, um, to look like this when you're 80. She's in very good shape. But any kind of exercise, it, it, it actually um, offers uh, um, the physical um, improvement in blood flow, in, so in brain function, but as well as heart, cardiovascular function in all parts of your body. And I'm sure you know that as well. We take this into the lab and we study animals that given um, uh, voluntary access to a running wheel 24 seven, so they always can run. And we show that older, older animals actually benefit from a running wheel just like younger animals. They don't run as much, but they do get the brain boost from the running. And we have little paradigms where we can actually put them on a running regimen so we can actually force them to run a certain amount of time. We start them with walking and then we go up to a certain amount of running. So we can control the amount of running instead of letting them voluntarily run. And in both cases we see improvements in um, cognition and in brain health and protection against um, insults that may produce diseases. So we know that, um, or neurodegenerate, neurodegeneration, we know that um, it's never too late to be active. And it's also never too late to be mentally active. Now, whether you're thinking about pie or pie, <laughs> um, both are probably engaging your brain, but probably engaging very different parts of your brain. And so you're probably going to boost your pie part of your brain, the eating part, um, if that's all you think about, and probably going to think your math and problem solving skills if you're thinking about Lisa's pie and not Homer's pie. Um, but any kind of thinking is going to boost brain function. Again, it's just going to boost the pr different kinds of problem solving because we think it's going to boost different brain areas. And that gets us into this, I couldn't resist, because this just came out yesterday in the Washington Post. And actually, it was colleagues from University of Illinois that I used to work with before I moved here that actually um, Liz Stein Morrow and Dan Simons um, wrote a very um, nice review on the, the studies that have suggested that brain training is good for cognition to protect you against degenerate neurodegeneration, protect you against Alzheimer's. Those are the claims made by this industry. And what they con the conclusion was that brain training games do train your brain to do one thing, to play brain training games. And <laughs> specifically those brain training games. So training does improve ability, but the data, and there's still, this is very controversial, and there's, there are two camps. One that believes that they work for lots of functions, and one that believes that they don't, that they only work for very specific functions. I'm probably somewhere in the middle, because I think we have some data that suggests that if you take an, a rat, actually, an old rat, and you give them a little, quick little task that just engages both parts of the brain that are involved with those different strategies that we use, it actually only boosts their ability in the strategy that they showed a deficit. Okay, so it will boost their place learning, but not their response learning. And then the young, it boosts their response learning and not their place. So I think there is some s selectivity, but there's also some generality too. I believe the thinking then is to engage in something that is difficult, new and difficult for you. So if you do the crossword puzzle every week and you're good at it, continuing to do the crossword puzzle is not going to boost your brain at all. Right. But it's trying something new, like a Sudoku or number game that's really hard is better, or learning a language or learning to play the piano. Yes, yeah, so, so mixing it up is really important for these effects. So once we, so, so the idea is that you probably are gaining strategies even for the, the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle where you, you know, if you do it enough, you get the similar words and you get how to solve it. You, you develop those strategies that will help you solve it. And the, and the more different the different tasks are, the more you benefit in terms of more global problem solving. And the different brain areas that get engaged and protected is what I would think. Well, isn't it true? I mean, there's some people that can look at something and they see the broad picture of mm -hmm. it, and other people see the details. Mm -hmm. 
and usually the one that sees the broader picture misses some of the details. But that seems to stay with you all your life, young or old. I mean, is that? Well, I think you're right. I think there's so there are some personality or some um, cognitive approaches that there are d d individual differences in learning. I think that's true. And I think what happens is through our lives, we probably continue to encourage those strategies that worked when we were younger. We continue to use those. When we, um, w but our, we would argue that as you get older, you tend to be better at the, the big picture because you do, just by, maybe it's by, because you lose some ability to remember the details. So you start to use those strategies. So if someone is a detail person, they may find aging to be quite stressful, the cognitive changes with age. Whereas someone that actually has always been a big picture, never good with the details, may actually not find it as stressful. So it would change probably the way stress even interacts, or the, what we consider challenging or difficult, how that interacts. Um, and so I didn't even talk about that element, but I think that's really, I think that's really true. And we can do that in the lab by making tasks. We can put more and more arms on those mazes. We can make the tasks harder or easier and see if it's one strategy. If you have a challenging strategy that's not so hard, do you still see the aging, the difference? Or if you make it really difficult, do you see a bigger <coughs> age difference? So we can actually test that in the lab. Donna, yeah. do you have a favorite, do you have favorite rats? You find yourself prejudiced by a particular rat. I like female rats better than male rats because they're cuter. They've got like stubbier noses. Um, they're a little bit more like little, they look like Mickey Mouse. Does that prejudice your results? No, but we can, no, so I think you, so we have a rule in the lab because we have to euthanize the animals to study their brains. We have a rule that we don't name them. Oh, um, okay. But, well, just because and then we don't want to yeah. treat them as pets. Right. Um, but we do actually, so you, you bring up an important point, let me just see, so this. you bring up an important point because I think we do have come in with um, prejudices, with biases. Yeah. Again, as to going back to the very beginning of the presentation where I said, it can change the way you do research. If you think that young is normative, so like this is, good, this is good cognition, what you see in a young animal, then we're gonna develop tests so young animals can do it well. Yeah. So we come in that way with big biases, and I think we prejudice our results because of that. And most of the work done in biology of aging has essentially done that. Psychology of aging has taken a very different approach, looking at the whole individual and how they, sort of the Gene Cohen approach and, pro and probably Bill Hoyer, this idea that you know, the whole individual is aging and that you take in the psychological health, sociological, cultural perspective, and so forth. Biologists say, with time, as, as but it happens, you know, yeah. stuff happens with time, and it's, things are going down and getting worse. And so we, being they, look for deficits, essentially. So devise the test so you know young animals do well, and let's see how badly old, how bad old animals are at that task. We go in and actually do it the other way almost. Okay, this is what an old animal can solve. Let's see how they're different from young animals. So in that way, I think we, we try, we're trying to reverse the biases, yeah. but we try to go in blind. You, you can always tell a young versus an old animal because they look different. They're bigger, they're a little scalier. I mean, you can tell, so it'd just be like, so you can't do it truly blind, yeah. but we don't know what, the, what um, experimental conditions the old animal's in and the young animal when we give them drugs or hormones and so forth. So we never know what condition they are. Um, so we don't know what to expect from the results, but we do, you know, we try not to influence our results. Now, have you done anything that, with the idea of rapid change? Like, because our society now is changing much more oh, rapidly than it did mm -hmm. previously. So mm -hmm. can you do anything with how quickly you're making changes in the maze, say? Oh, I see. We do look at, we do look at um, <coughs> speed and so forth, but we don't actually look for rapidity, uh, speed of the individual's choices, but we don't look for change in their environment or things like rapid changes in environment. But that's an interesting point. Um, and some people do speeded tests so that you could actually see how well the animals can keep up with um, quick tests, quick tests or just open-ended. Most of ours are relatively open-ended. So we allow the animals to make their choices. We sometimes, we have a timeout so after two minutes of not making a choice, the animals will time out. And so we try to take that into account as well. Okay, so just to follow up, oh, to finish up, excuse me, um, and these are very interesting conversations and I could keep going if we had all the time. 
Um, but just to, some concluding remarks, um, we find shifts in abilities with age that may reflect uh, forgetting, might be one of them, and I think forgetting is actually important. Um, we actually just wanted to make a quick point that I didn't mention, that if you think about what the brain does every day, it actually forgets much more than it remembers. So imagine all of the information sort of bombarding your nervous system right now, okay? And take that and multiply it by however many seconds there are in a day. I should have calculated that before I came in. Um, and then think about that. So if you remembered every detail, you know, that I just hit the microphone, for example, down to a sigh that I just, you know, a sigh that I just heard or a movement, you wouldn't be able to think about all that information cluttering your brain. So forgetting is what the brain does. It's what it's good at. And again, What's that? Brain overload. Yeah, yeah, brain overload. And so forgetting is an active process, I believe, actually. And others think that it's more of a passive process, but I think it's active. Um, there is real world staging. Expertise can compensate for losses, and there's improvement in problem solving in lots of real world settings. Um, and then just finally, that physical and mental fitness can keep your brain healthy. <clears throat> but then I want to end with this idea of to embrace your strengths, just like you brought up. You may have always been good at details, and if you're still good at details, embrace it and use them to help you solve your daily problems. And hopefully those are far and few between. <laughs> um, so I want to end with an Oliver Sacks, who's just, I just love him. I, I had promised myself that I would write him a letter before he passed away, because I knew he was ill, and I didn't get to it. So it's something, it's something I'll always regret. So that's why I just quote him a lot. But anyway, he had a friend, a dear friend, that would, on his birthday, give him the element from the periodic table <laughs> that matched his age. I think it started when he was 50, and it's really clever. And I think that's such a great idea. And so Oliver said, at 11, I could say, I am sodium, element 11. But now at 79, I can say I am gold. And so I just wanted to end with that. So thank you. Thank you. And this is also a reference to Paul Gold's um, commentary, if some of you were here, on the witches that he described, the witches and the chemicals that um, help the witches to jump, fly around on their brooms. <laughs> um, 